God is greater than my failures. God is greater than my fears. God is greater than my questions. God is greater than my career. God is greater than my wallet. God is greater than my insecurities. God is greater than my doubts. God is greater than my pain. God is greater than me. So there's this New Testament professor in Chicago, and every year with his first year students, he does an experiment that's pretty interesting. He has his students get out a piece of paper, and on that piece of paper, he has them draw a line down the middle to make two columns, and he says, okay, so for the column on the left, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down everything you think God is like, all right, so feelings, attributes, characteristics. You write down everything you think God is like. And his students, they do that after a few minutes. They're done. And he says, okay, now the column on the right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down everything you think you are like. Write down your characteristics and your attributes. You go ahead and and write that down. Then when the students are done, he has them compare and contrast the answers from the column on the left, the column on the right. And you know what he's found out after doing this year after year after year? Those columns are about 90% identical. And it really does make you think with that study. Uh, Certainly, there are ways in which we reflect God. We are made in his image. But it does raise the question, if not the concern, that perhaps when we think about God, we're actually just thinking about a slightly larger version of ourselves. Voltaire, the philosopher, once said that God created man in his own image, and man has been trying to repay the favor ever since. And so what we want to get at this morning is, especially during this series, if we want to get our thoughts, our our minds on God as we prepare for Easter Sunday, we really want to ask the question, how do we actually know what God is like? How do we actually know what God is like? We said last week that God operates on a whole other playing field than we do, so his thoughts are are beyond our thoughts. His ways are beyond our ways. And so uh, naturally, we cannot fathom these things on our own. And today, what I want us to do is I want us to answer that question, why is it so important to know what God is really like? And how do we know that? How do we know what God is really like? To answer that question, there are two passages we're going to look at primarily this morning, Exodus chapter 20 and Exodus chapter 32. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and get to those passages. And to set us up as you are turning there, Exodus 20 is a pretty popular one in the Old Testament. This is where we get the Ten Commandments. Now, depending on your background, if you were like me, if you were a church kid, you may have had to memorize these growing up. Maybe you did a little song and dance to memorize. I would do it for you, but I will, I'll save myself the embarrassment. But essentially, the Ten Commandments, they are coming shortly after what God has done with the Israelites. God has saved them, has rescued and redeemed them out of Egypt in a really supernatural way. So again, maybe if you grew up in church or not, most people are pretty familiar with this story that the Israelites were rescued out of Egypt by the hand of God. And then you get to the Red Sea story and the Red Sea's part for the Israelites and they walk on dry land and then the Egyptians follow them and the Red Sea closes and God defeats Israel's enemies. And then they start wandering through the desert. They are led by a pillar of smoke by day, a pillar of fire by night. These are all very supernatural things where people, uh, you can't help but wonder if you're the Israelites, you can't help but wonder, wow, this is God and he's on our side and he cares about us and he's rescuing us. Shortly thereafter, God creates the Ten Commandments as a way of saying, Uh, I love you and I've rescued you and like a father to his children, let me guide you and show you how to live life in order that you may experience my love to the fullest so that you can experience my blessings to the fullest. So commandment number one that God gives the Israelites is you shall not have any other gods before me. 
okay? Simple enough. We'll get into it in the midweek. There's actually a whole lot of stuff going on in that first commandment. But then we get to commandment number two, which brings us to Exodus chapter 20. Read along with me, verse four. God says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation for those who hate me. All right, now, at first glance, it sounds kind of like commandment number one and commandment number two are pretty similar. Sounds like commandment number one, okay, don't bow down and worship any gods. And commandment number two, don't worship any statues of gods. But that is not quite it. Commandment number one is about worshiping the right God as opposed to the wrong God. And commandment number two is about worshiping the right God, but in the right way. And this is the God of the universe that we are talking about here. And he says, no, you will not create any images of me. Now, here's why that's important. All right. So 3,500 years ago in the Middle East, other nations, other religions, if they wanted to worship their God, they would make an image of their God and they would take wood or stone and carve out what they think, what they picture their God to be like. They would call these things images or icons. And these images were not gods in and of themselves. They were pieces of rock or wood and they would serve as this sort of gateway between the earthly realm and the spiritual realm. And if you garnered enough favor with your God, if you offered the right sacrifices to your God, the spirit of your God would descend into these images and icons for you to worship and you would receive their blessing. And God is saying, no, 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 that's, that may be how the other nations work, but that's not how we work. That's not how this relationship is gonna work here. And what's wild is of all the 10 commandments, don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, all of those commandments, of all of them, this is the very first one that the Israelites break. Skip on down to chapter 32. All right, read with me verse one. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, in other words, Moses had been up with God creating the law. Moses had been with God face to face on the mountain while God's people were waiting. Verse one, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron, Moses' brother, and said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. You can sort of pick up on the tone, right? They start to boss and bully Aaron around and they're mocking Moses because he's taking too long up on the mountain. Verse two, Aaron said to them, okay, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, bring them to me. Which side note, it's important to see the gold in their ears. Where did that come from? It came from the Egyptians. When God rescued them out of Egypt, the Israelites took the gold from the Egyptians. So it's like there's these tangible reminders that are on their bodies that God has supernaturally worked in their lives pretty recently. Verse three, so all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears. They brought them to Aaron and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Verse five, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Feast to the Lord. Notice who the feast is for. The Lord, all caps. We talked about that last week. Aaron used the name of Yahweh saying, this is the image that rescued you, that saved you from Egypt. And then if the verse, if this passage wasn't weird enough, okay, then we get to verse six, check this out. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt sacrifices and offered peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That word play is a Hebrew word, sakah, and it was a Hebrew idiom, most likely referring to sexual intercourse. So basically, 
They make an image of God into a big, shiny, golden cow. They began worshiping in front of it. They offer sacrifices to it, trying to evoke God's favor to come down, inhabit this image. And naturally, they start doing this ritual, and thousands of people publicly in broad daylight get really drunk. And then we can read between the lines here, right? That's what's going on. Now, with us being removed from this story some 3,500 years later, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, (laughs) what a weird story for you to pick out on Sunday. So I guess the moral of the story is don't worship in front of gold statues and don't get super drunk with thousands of people and have sexual intercourse with thousands of people. I mean, Okay, cool, let's, let's pray. No, that's, that's not quite it. While most of us would scratch our heads at a story like this uh, and ask, why is this in the Bible? This story actually reveals something pretty revealing about the human condition. And the first clue is figuring out exactly what they are worshiping to and why that's significant. So this bull, this golden calf that they worshiped, why was that such a big deal? All right, two reasons. Number one, the surrounding pagan nations had images of their gods that looked exactly like this. The surrounding nations would do exactly what the Israelites just did. But God's people were supposed to be set apart. They were supposed to look differently, to behave differently, because God was altogether categorically different. But instead, Israel wanted their God to be just like everyone else's. They were trying to take the mystery and the bigness and the grandness of God, and they were trying to put him into more manageable terms that best suited them. And reason number two The bull in the ancient Near East was a symbol of strength and power. In the ancient Near East, which were agrarian societies, people would bow down and worship to animal images, whether that be a bull or a horse or a goat. And each one had their own special attribute that you had to perform for. And if you're the Israelites, think about it. If if you're the Israelites and you're wandering through the desert, what are you feeling you're probably feeling pretty weak and powerless, like you don't have any control. And you start to think, all right, we need, we need our God. We need his favor. We need his blessings. We need his benefits on our side. You know what we need? We need his power and we need his strength. And they look around the four nations and they say, oh, a bull. Yeah, that's what we need to shape God like into a bull. They were feeling insecure and they felt like God had bailed on them. That God wasn't working on their own timeline. So they had to take matters into their own hands because God wasn't working on their own expectations. And while I know none of us are probably going home today to bow down and worship in front of a large gold statue, in your living room right now, the reality is all of us make God into our own image in some form or fashion. And this manifests itself in all sorts of ways in our lives. A number of ways we can make God in our image perhaps can be our upbringing. Maybe the way you grew up in your home, your family of origin, your parents or your authority figure behaved a certain way. So now you project those attributes onto God that are not accurate. Or maybe you came from a religious background and were believing one thing about God that wasn't completely true. For what it's worth, we have a lot of stories of people who come to our church who become Christians, and a lot of their stories were, I grew up believing this certain thing about God, but then I realized that that wasn't true. That's one way we fashion God into our own image is because of our upbringing. Another big one is perhaps our feelings or perhaps our culture, right? We love the things about the Bible, specifically how God is loving and how he's forgiving and how he's compassionate on the weak and the destitute. But when it comes to this God of justice, a God of wrath, a God who is holy, 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 there are parts that make us squirm and there are parts in culture that say, no, 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 we don't, we don't like that. God has to keep up with the times. And when we do that, we fashion God into our own image. Or there are ways in which we allow our desires to shape God into our own image. We think that God exists to make us comfortable 
to make us happy. There are certain things we want out of life, whether that's a good career or a good salary or a relationship with someone. And so God exists to give us the things that we want in life. But when we do that, we are fashioning God into our own image. Or sometimes we shape God into our own image based on whatever sin we wrestle with. And that this plays itself out in a couple of ways. Maybe when you view God, you view him as compassionate and forgiving and merciful with other people's sin. But when it comes to your sin, man, that you just can't seem to acknowledge that God is gracious and forgiving and merciful. You just cannot hear that. Or on the flip side, maybe you think that God is merciful and forgiving towards your sin, but the sins of everyone else, especially the people who sin against you, well, those are the people that God is really mad at. Either way, we are fashioning a God into our own image. Did a fun little exercise this week, and I decided to list out all the ways in which I inadvertently make God into my own image. So let me see if any of these ring out true for you. This is God according to Jake, okay? According to my false view of God, if I am a good enough Christian, if I do enough good things, God will bless me with financial security, and I will never, ever have to think about money again. Or if I am a good enough dad, according to my false view of God, if I'm a good enough dad, then my kids will always obey me, they will always be polite and respectful to people. They won't yell or scream, and they will graduate from the top of their class one day. Or, and here's one, man, that I, I wrestle with a ton. If I'm really, really good at my job, people will always respect me. People will always think I'm awesome. And our church would be really, 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 really healthy. My false image of God at the same time is also really gracious towards my sin. Like I, I can struggle with anger and being irritable, but you know, my false image of God, he's really gracious with me because you know, sometimes God gets angry and he's irritable about things too. And so he's very understanding of my sin, but man, other people's sin, well, man, God's really out to get them. But this is a false image of God. This is a false image of him. And the problem is when we create a false image of God, you know what we end up doing? We just end up creating a bigger version of ourselves. We become like Thomas Jefferson who took scissors to the Bible. And we might not do this on a conscious level, but subconsciously the things that offend us, the things that we don't like about the Bible or about God, we take our mental scissors to the Bible and we cut out the pieces and the parts that we don't like. And when that happens, we have this wonky sort of version of God that's not true to the God of the scriptures. If you've ever been to the state fair or something, if you've ever seen a fun house mirror, you know how it distorts the real thing. But this is what happens when we create a false image of God. We create this fun house mirror version of God that's not true to reality. In fact, Hollywood has picked up on this recently. Hollywood picked up on the fact that we all make God into our own image and decide to parody this in the 2006 cinema classic, Talladega Nights. And in one scene in particular, it is Will Ferrell's character and John C. Riley's character, and they're praying for their breakfast. And then they have this little exchange. Will Ferrell says, you know, I like to think of Christmas baby Jesus best. That's who I pray to. Uh, the one who is eight pounds, six ounces, baby Jesus, all snuggly there in your diapers, in your crib, and yet omnipotent. To which John C. Riley, he's praying, and he says, you know what? I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because it says, I want to be formal, but I'm here to party. And then the next one, you know, I like to picture Jesus as a figure skater. He comes out wearing a white outfit and he does interpretive ice dances to all my life's journeys. And it is one of the funniest scenes in the movie, but you know what it's actually doing? It's actually poking fun at what we do as, as individuals living in America, living, uh, just being a part of the human experience is that we all do this. We all shape Jesus. We all shape God into our own image that what we feel like, how we think is best. We end up creating a false image of God. 
And that's a silly example. But even though we are some 3,000 years after the story in Exodus, it reveals that this is something we all do. And here's what happens. When you upplay or downplay certain things about God to suit our liking, to fit our mold, what we end up doing is we actually create a false image of God. And when we do that, it goes terribly for us. Check out how God talks about it back in Exodus chapter 20. Look how commandment number two ends the way it does. For those who make a false image of him, according to the text, it says that he punishes those who hate me. Notice that when we create a false image of God, God says what you are doing is you hate me. And for us, that sounds harsh, but think about it. When we reinvent God for ourselves, when we prune certain parts about him that we don't like, God calls that hatred of him. It exposes in us that when we do this, we really hate who he actually is. We don't want to come to God humbly, and we don't want to submit to his good design for us. We flip the script and we say, no, God, you have to submit to our liking. You have to submit to according to how we think life ought to operate. But if you've ever had a close friendship or if you've ever, if you are married, you just know like this is not how relationships work, right? In any relationship, when you downplay things you don't like about them and upplay certain things that you do like, uh, it goes bad for us, right? We don't make demands on what another person ought to be to use them and just distort them and to make them fit our mold according to the Bible, it is to hate them because it is a rejection of their personhood. So to give you an illustration to help uh, wrap our minds around this, uh, me and my wife, Lucy, uh, she is really great with our kids. We have three kids, ages six, four, and two. She's really great with our kids. Uh, It is one of the many things that I, I love about her. And Imagine what would happen if I come home from a long day of work and she's been watching the kids and kids are running around, you know, tackling each other, having fun. I could tell she's a little exhausted from watching them. And she asks, how's your day, honey? And I say, not right now. Just just keep on watching the kids. And I I go downstairs into my study and I'm doing some work. Okay, let's say an hour and a half passes or so. Kids are starting to get loud and dinner's about to start and she could really use my help. But I say, no, honey, you've got this. You're great at this. Let me just keep working. You do you. You're awesome. I love you. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Okay. Then another hour passes. All right. And I hear screaming and I hear crying and I hear wailing coming from upstairs. And then I hear my kids. And at a certain point, my wife comes down and she says, help, like, I need help, help me, help me. And I say, babe, you've got this. I love you. You're really good at this. I'm busy. I'll talk to you later. You've got this under control. I'll see you later. Bye. At a certain point, how do you think that's going to go for my relationship with her? It's not going to go well. It is not going to go well. It's going to go terribly because at the end of the day, I am just using her to get something that I want. It ends up destroying our relationship altogether. My love for her in reality becomes hatred because I'm not respecting her as a person. I'm supposed to love her and cherish her and partner with her. When in reality, in that example, I am just using her to make life more comfortable for me. And yet this is what happens when we create a false image of God. And this is what was happening with the Israelites. What God is saying is when you do that, you are using me to get what you want. You're not loving me according to who I am. And what you're really doing is you're hating me. But here's the thing. When we love a false image of God, a God that that we've made in our own image, he actually becomes in the process pretty weak and powerless and frail because he ends up just being a slightly bigger version of you. He's no longer the omnipotent God of the universe. He becomes a God that you can manage to your liking. But your God 
cannot handle the test of time. It's inevitable that this fake God that you've propped up for yourself will eventually disappoint you. So if you remake God think he's, thinking he's all about giving you comfort and giving you happiness, then what happens when suffering and trials and pain come your way? If you think God exists purely to make your life comfortable, then you're left thinking, God, why on earth did you do this? And then you walk away from God. But here's the thing. You weren't really worshiping and honoring the God of scriptures. You were worshiping and honoring a God of your own liking, a God of your own invention. Or if you believe that God just exists to give you what you want, then what happens when you don't get what you want? If you think God exists to give you a good career or comfort or a relationship, then what happens when that relationship come, does not come your way? You get frustrated and you, you shake your fist at God and say, God, why would you do this to me? But when you do that, you were never serving the God of scriptures. You were serving a fake God, a God of romance. Or what happens when you fashion God into your own image or based off of your feelings or your cultural preferences and someone says something that just bucks up against what you believe about God or someone calls you out and, and says that uh, your view of God is incorrect? What happens if you fashion God according to your feelings or your cultural preferences, when that happens, you become self-righteous and judgmental of other people because you've created a God who is explainable, who is always on your side. But the moment something happens and you don't have a logical explanation for it, you walk away and you deconstruct, but you weren't ever really understanding the God of scriptures. It was a fake God that you created, that you put in your own little box. Or what happens when you remake God according to your sin and you think God is gracious and forgiving of other people's sin, but no way he's understanding and forgiving of my sin. Your sin inevitably crushes you over time. It leaves your vitality just cold and lifeless. Or if you think on the flip side that God is really gracious and understanding with your sin, but not the sin of others, what happens? Over time, you start to become judgmental of other people. And when people who love you and want to call you out in your sin, you just get angry and frustrated and say, no, you don't understand. And your blind spots get larger and larger. And then whatever sin that is just slowly destroys you whether that be greed or pride or lust or whatever. In all these things, what happens, your deformed version of God ends up deforming you. Your deformed version of God ends up deforming you. Karl Barth, the uh, theologian, said this, if our God never contradicts us or makes us mad, then we are likely not worshiping him, but a reflection of ourselves. You see, when we set up a false image of God, we end up setting up for ourselves an avalanche of inevitable disappointment and despair because at the end of the day, we're not worshiping the real God. We're just elevating and worshiping a, a version of ourselves and we're putting ourselves up on the throne and not God. But if you really want to know God, then you need to be willing to listen to God, including and especially the things that you don't like and especially the things that upset you. And you need to be receptive towards God's people who might tell you things that you don't in particular want to hear, to hear things that just might upset you because you know, even still, it is good for you. That it is good for you because if you let the God of Scripture speak into your life, what he's really about, even if you're upset, or even if you're offended, you know that on the other side of that is deeper intimacy and understanding with the God of the universe. We quoted him last week, but Tim Keller says this. He says, only the faith that believes God regarding things it doesn't want to hear can believe God about the things it desperately does want to hear. God's love for you, God's forgiveness for you, God's kindness towards you, God's power that dwells in you, God's control of your life. It requires hearing everything about God, not just the certain parts that suit your own liking, but 
everything. So if you're here this morning and you desperately need to hear that God loves you and is with you and will never forsake you, then that includes listening to the same God who will inevitably, inevitably offend your sensibilities from time to time. It requires being open to the people in our church family who love you and who love Jesus and who love you enough to call you out and to bring you back to the good life that is found in the scriptures when you're off. But you don't get the option to pick and choose. Maybe you're here this morning and you're racked by guilt or shame or anxiety and you desperately need to hear that God is in control and that he is the God of peace and you need to hear that spoken over your life right now. Then it also requires that you accept even the parts of scripture you don't like because you know that's good for you even if you don't like it and even if you don't understand it. Only when we see him rightly can we experience real intimacy and relationship with a God who is greater than us. And only then can we experience a life more and more in his presence. Only when we allow him to shape us into his image and not the other way around can we begin to walk in a life filled with the spirit full of love and joy and peace. A life that looks more and more like Jesus. Jesus is calling us not to look within ourselves to figure out who God is like. Jesus is calling us to look at him, to look at him. Colossians 1.15 says this of Jesus, that he is the image of the invisible God. He is the image. Notice that word image. He is the image of the invisible God. Thinking back in Exodus, it's like God is saying, you will not make any images of me. Instead, God, out of his his love and his grace towards you says, instead, if you really want to know who I am, let me show you an image of myself. And his name is Jesus. If you want to know who I am really like, look at the image of Jesus. See, we have something that the Israelites did not have 3,500 years ago. We have Jesus. We have Jesus, the image of of the invisible God. So we don't have to speculate. We don't have to guess. We don't have to try to figure out what God is like. God says, if you want to know who I really am, if you want to know what, I li- what I'm like and what I love, look at my son, Jesus. Jesus on full display in his life, we see a beautiful mosaic of all of God's attributes. We see him as fully God with all power and all wisdom. And we see him born in a manger as a vulnerable baby. He's both. In Jesus, we see him stubbornly confronting people who are self-righteous and stuck in sin. And at the same time, we see Jesus uh, compassionately caring for those who know that they need a savior. It's both. We see the woman in John chapter 8 confront the woman who's caught in sexual sin. We say, we see Jesus compassionately looking her in the eyes and lifting her up in her shame and brokenness and forgiving her. And we see the same Jesus in John chapter 8 tell that woman in sexual sin, go and sin no more. We see Jesus filled with gentleness towards the weak and the poor and the destitute and those who are sick with sin. And we see Jesus uh, with that same Jesus filled with righteous anger, flipping over tables in the temple for those who defile God's name. In Jesus, we see his disciples, Peter, James, and John, on the mountain where Jesus in the transfiguration displays his full godhood, his full brilliance and glory like this flash of lightning and all this awestruck wonder. We see that same Jesus just a few chapters later on the mount of crucifixion showcasing his full glory in his compassion and love for you when he dies on the cross for your sin. If you really want to see Jesus If you really want to see Jesus, look at all of what he has done for us and for you and what he promises he will do. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday. If you want to see who this God is really like, who on the cross we see a God who loves us and a God who is holy. 
and so unlike us. We see a God who hates sin on the cross, and we see a God who loves the sinner. We see a God who loves you where you are, and a God who loves you enough to call you towards repentance, to call you towards faith again and again and again. We see a God who allowed himself to be crushed by your sin and a God who conquered death because sin could not hold him down. This is the God we worship. This is what God is really like. And when you receive him and and follow him in all his fullness and all his glory, here's what happens. His image begins to radiate off of you. His image begins to reshape you and how you think and how you feel and what you do. If our deformed versions of God end up deforming us when we worship the right God, we become transformed, transformed in his image. He begins to remake you so that you look more like him. The peace of God, the love of God, all tied in when we look into the perfect image of Jesus. And this is the God we worship. This is the God we are called to believe, to close the gap daily, moment by moment, to close the gap between what we think about God and what we actually know is true about God. To know that he is greater than our own image of him, and that is the best thing for us. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for sending your son Jesus down to earth. Thank you that in just a few weeks, we get to celebrate that all over again, that you have conquered death, that you are truly God, that no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter how much we try to prop up these false images of who we think you are, You love us too much to just keep us there, but to show us your brilliance and your glory. And Spirit, we ask, will you show us your glory? Will you show us your glory right now? Will you show us your glory this week? Will you continue to remind us who you really are like by looking at the scriptures, by looking at all of the scriptures? And will you meet us there and lead us to repentance as we close the gap more and more, day by day, slowly by slowly, closing the gap between our false image of you and the image of your son, Jesus, for your good and for your glory. We pray this in his name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. If you are brand new to our church, we exist to be a Jesus-centered family on mission, which means we want to make much of Jesus. We want to be a family together to make Jesus known in our neighborhoods, in our lives, in our city, in the world. And so if you're brand new with us, head on over to our website and click the connect card, fill out your information. We'll make sure someone on staff gets in touch with you to tell you more about our church and how you can get involved. We have a couple of events in mind that we want to update you on. The first one is our Good Friday service coming up soon. Our Midtown Lexington Church is going to be hosting that in their brand new building. So if you want to attend that live, make sure to go to our website and RSVP for that. And if you're unable to make it, we also are going to have a live stream link available for you. Our second event is Easter Sunday, and we will be hosting this in our downtown building And we have limited seating available. So if you want to have a seat in the auditorium, make sure to go to our website and RSVP. We will also have a live stream available for you there. And we're really excited about it. We have some surprises in store that we think y'all would really love. So make sure to go to our website for more information to RSVP and to get those live streams. So thanks, and we'll see you later.